My name is Kim Morgan, I'm the Outreach and Communications Coordinator here at UCL Biochemical Engineering. It's fantastic to have you with us for this uh, Spring into STEM Taster Lecture. Um, so I'm quickly going to take you through how the session is going to work before handing over to my colleague. So you will have seen that there's, well, some of you will have seen there's a chat function at the bottom and a Q&A number of buttons, but if you have any technical problems, any issues with the sound, uh, with the video, uh, anything like that, let us know in the chat. Myself and Jack will both be able to see that. Um, you're more than welcome to ask questions at any point in the session as they occur to you. If there's anything in a slide that you'd like to know more about, or you'd like you've got a question, just put it in the Q&A box. But do please put it in the Q&A box rather than the chat. It's a lot easier for us to be able to look at the questions when it comes to the end of the session. This session is being recorded and it will be made available to people afterwards. But we have to go through each recording and make sure that the, um, the transcription is correct. So it can take us a few weeks to go through that and upload it. So whilst it be made available, it won't be for, it won't be immediate. Um, apart from that, um, I'm going to launch a couple of polls because we're really interested to know um, whether the people who are joining us have an offer to study with us. So I've just launched a poll. If you could let us know, that would be really useful. Um, it very much helps us to know who's um, who's attending, how people found out about it. So, at the moment, uh, with the numbers coming through, it looks like, um, ooh, very interesting numbers. So it looks like at the moment, most people have an offer, well, most people don't have an offer to study, so that's very interesting. So we're assuming that you're prospective students or, or, or just interested in the subject, which is great. Um, so a number of people have an offer to study with us, really looking forward to that hopefully you come and join us in September and other people have some, as an offer elsewhere at UCL so fantastic very helpful thank you very much for that and the next question is we just we're just interested in what level of study you would be more interested in so would you be more interested in studying a degree it's like a BEng or a postgraduate um, it helps us know um, how our reach is going and, and make sure that we're pitching this at the right level so at the moment it looks like the majority of people who are here in the audience will be more interested in a uh, postgraduate, so an MSc. Um, but quite a few are interested in degree level as well. So thank you very much for completing those polls. It's enormously helpful to us. Um, that's really great. So I'm going to end that poll now. Um, and now that I've got that useful information, and I know that you can hear me fine, <laughs> I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Jack Jeffries. Jack. Oh, oh just, so just before we go, just to let you know, I'll turn my camera off, but I will be around in the background. If you have any technical problems, please message me in chat, or if all else fails, you can email me. I have email running. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, seeing you over lunchtime. So as Kim said, um, my name's Jack, Dr. Jack Jeffries. I'm a lecturer here at Biochemical Engineering at UCL in biocatalysis and biocatalytic engineering. But today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about BioCat, but that's its interplay then with sustainability, this concept of sustainability. So if you can all hear me all right, try and get my computer to work. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you for about 40 minutes, and we have about 20 minutes of questions at the end, um, about uh, biocatalysis and sustainability. So sustainability, what is it? What does it mean? It's a word that's becoming more and more common. You see it used a lot. We're going to discuss that topic a bit. Biocatalysis may or may not be a term you've heard before, but it's probably something you actually know, and that's what we'll talk about, trying to introduce the concept of biocatalysis uh, to you. Then I'm going to try to use some case studies about how biocatalysis has been implemented in industry and how it might become to be implemented to address this concept of sustainability. And then with just a bit of time at the end, I'm going to talk about um, enzyme discovery, which is a key part of uh, biocatalysis. And that then is a bit more about my work here at UCL and about uh, how that work fits in again with sustainability. So, so what is this concept of sustainability? It's one of those words to me that has uh, 
getting more and more prominent. You're hearing it more and more often now. It's a bit like eco. It's a prefix to lots of words or as added on to terms eco or green or sustainability. And when you think about sustainability, it usually comes with a graphic, which is a tree or a nice globe or the rec recycling symbol that you've seen here. And it's usually attached to some process. So we've got sustainable farming here. And we can maybe intuitively think about how we could make farming more sustainable pesticide use, water use, things like that. Uh, the image with the coat hanger is supposed to denote sustainable uh, garment production, so sustainable fashion. We've probably all heard about the uh, impacts of the fashion industry and consumable uh, fashion on the planet. And how do you make that more sustainable? And those things seem intuitive and we can understand how that might be, but also it's applied to maybe slightly things which are probably are less sustainable or, or am uh, am amenable to sustainability, things like Bitcoin, sustainable Bitcoin, will there ever be uh, sustainable Bitcoin? Of course, you know, that has a huge energy demand. And the bottom one is actually supposed to be sustainable uh, air fuel. Is that, is that a possibility? Biofuels, of course, would make it sustainable, but is that sustainable can we produce biofuels at the scale to support uh, consumer like consumerist air travel the scale of air travel we have now um, and I was saying to Kim before we came on I was looking for really extreme examples and I, I did put in sustainable coal see if anybody had tried to put those two things together but they haven't gone that far just yet so you can see that sustainability is a term that can be applied to lots of different things very discrete uh, processes, maybe which don't seem to have a lot of overlap. So what, what's, how can we make that term make sense and make it apply across those fields, but still have some sort of sense or utility really? Um, and this is just a little joke that I saw a sustainability uh, talk um, about the prevalence of the use of the word sustainability and how it's kind of a hot topic right now. And uh, the, you know, the, that by 2061, it will occur once in every sentence. And then 2109, it would be, all sentences would just be sustainable. So our usage of the word sustainable is, is unsustainable. Um, don't say we, we can't uh, have jokes in science. We, we can, it may not be good, or, but uh, we can try. So if we're trying to define sustainability and there are lots of different ways, the UN has put out uh, package on how you might define sustainability and actually it might be a bit wider a bit broader than you would think I know that when I think about sustainability when I first thought about sustainability I really think about climate change think about co2 reduction having a sustainable and livable planet but there are lots of other aspects of how we live and how we make and produce things which feed into sustainability and that's around um waste, responsible consumption and production is on there, uh, the use of water, overuse of water, of course, that's uh, something that needs to be addressed, particularly in farming, that's a good example. Um, but the sustainability of human life as well, so good health and well-being, the provision of medicines, climate action, of course, and CO2 reduction and fossil fuel reliance being a big part of that, but also then um, the, uh, the environment, so they've got life below water, they're talking about aquatic life, life on land, so land uses and land spoilage you can think of there, plastic waste in the oceans, things like that. So that's already quite broad themes that would fall under a sustainability goal and uh, not necessarily obvious from the outset how you would go about addressing those in those different fields that we spoke about. So that's just a little introduction about what sustainability might be and this is the UN's attempt to define that and make sure that we start to think and pursue our processes in a sustainable manner um, and I'll be referencing that as we go through so that's kind of just an overview of what sustainability might mean it might get you thinking in different ways about the word sustainability so that's sustainability but what about the other half of the of of the talk, the other half of the equation, uh, bi biocatalysis. Now, some of you may have heard the, the term before, or you're aware of the term. Um, but for those that haven't, what it really comes down to, and I've got it up on the screen here, is the biological systems catalyzing, speeding up reactions between organic compounds. And that sounds very dry. And we say, okay, but what does that actually mean? And really, it is just the process of life. And it's all around us all the time. So from plants 
fixing carbon dioxide, making uh, oxygen, making the things that we use. So all of the food production, that's, that's all by catalysis, but also of course our metabolism of those products. That's also an example of biocatalysis, breaking down those products to make energy or to build new cellular materials. Um, I've got a picture of wood on there as a representation of all the materials that we take and use from the natural world, which is an example of biocatalysis. So wood, the deposition of lignin in trees that we use as a structural element, but also things like the fibers we use, natural fibers, cotton, wool, that's all reliant on biocatalysis, the creation of new bonds uh, to make materials in this case. But it's not just materials in that sense that you can touch and use, but also chemicals that we might use um, for medicines. And that's, I have the picture there of the, the opium poppy and the production of morphine, which is a very uh, important uh, chemical in use uh, pain relief. That's all examples of biocatalysis. As soon as you start to realize and recognize that, that's, you understand that it is all around us all the time. The, uh, the processes, the natural processes of life. And of course, it's not just the production of these chemicals, these materials, uh, but also their degradation and back to other materials. So the process of rotting and decomposition, either through metabolism by animals or bacteria or other uh, organisms like fungi and the breakdown of those natural materials, but also potentially the breakdown of non-natural materials. Um, and we're gonna come on to that a bit later when we talk about uh, potential routes for plastic degradation. So all of those sort of things are biocatalysis and that's great, you might say, okay, great. That's great, the fundamental process of life, the production of materials we, we use, what's that got to do with sustainability? And um, what that has to do with sustainability comes out from some of the characteristics of the agents which carry out that biocatalysis, which in the main, not exclusively, but in the main are enzymes. Um, and that's what I'm gonna focus on, talk to you a bit about more today in the context of sustainability. So if we take that example, the opium poppy, morphine, it's a very important drug in a clinical setting for pain relief. And we look at what it is, it's a very complicated 3D chemical structure that plays an important role in its activity. It has its backbone, the carbon backbone, but it is also decorated around that structure with hydroxyl groups and oxygens in the ring, in red, and that nitrogen atom there in blue with the methyl group. And where those groups are, on the molecule uh, and their chirality, um, so their handedness, if you're familiar with the term, if not, maybe discuss it a bit in the question section, um, all plays an important role in the efficacy of that molecule. And um, the wonderful thing about biocatalysis, and I'll draw this out in a, in a comparison now, is that the production of this very important molecule is all done um, at sort of ambient or environmental temperatures. So the growth conditions of the opium poppy, atmospheric sort of 25, maybe up to 40, very hot countries, and it's an aqueous solution. So in the cellular solution, water, and it's all carried out sort of ambient, uh, neutral pHs around pH 7.5, which are sort of, easily maintained conditions, which don't need a lot of energy to maintain them, if you were talking about doing those in an industrial setting. Um, but also those enzymes can do those reactions, can do the additions, can make those molecules in a very specific regio, so the shape, but also enantio, and that's to do with the chirality of the molecule, specific way, with very high specificities. And that's important when you're talking about drug compounds and you may be familiar with um, uh, thalidomide, the drug, which was uh, had very devastating effects on, on women with uh, children, caused um, uh, deformations of the child born, and that was due to um, not being in antiopure. So instead of being just one type of the molecule, it was a mixture, and the, and the one in antima uh, cured mooning sickness, and the other in antima uh, caused this... Uh, deformation of the 
um, fetus growth. Um, so it's very important in, in, in pharma pharmacology and medicinal chemistry to make sure that you can produce a, a, a molecule uh, which is pure, an anti-pure. And the reason I've drawn that, you don't have to pay too much attention to those structures. The reason I've drawn that out is as I want to make a comparison with a chemical organic synthesis. So if we were trying to replicate what the opium poppy does in the lab, how would we do it? Is it possible? And there are many sequences, many syntheses to morphine. But what I want to draw out is that instead of in with the opium poppy, where it's carried out at ambient temperature in water conditions and neutral pHs, these reactions require quite harsh conditions. A lot of these steps on the right carry out up at 200 degrees. They're under um, organic solvent, they use, uh, can use metal catalysts in a lot of these syntheses. So they have quite a toxic uh, requirement to produce the same output. So if we can harness the power of enzymes by catalysis to create these products under aqueous conditions at ambient pressures and temperatures, without the need for organic solvents, and by that I mean sort of fossil fuel derived solvents, there's a possibility there to generate chemicals, fine chemicals and materials in a more sustainable way. And so once you understand the ability of enzymes to do that, then we can start to try and apply them. And I'm gonna show you a few examples of how they've been applied in industry now. Some and some potential ways that they may be applied in the future. So I'll just give you the example of uh, citagliptin. Now, citagliptin phosphate is an um, anti-diabetic drug. It's very commonly prescribed to the uh, parent company who makes it. It's worth $5.2 billion worth of sales uh, in 2020. So it's a big product. Uh, it's a big seller. And it's a, it's a you know, key part in the treatment of diabetes, which is a, uh, you know, a very prevalent disease, certainly in uh, certain Western nations. And a lot of the synthesis for this molecule is done organically. In fact, it's, it's all done organically. It's a non-natural chemical, so it's not coming from a plant or a biological source. So its synthesis is done using organic synthesis in a way which is equivalent, perhaps, or similar to how that morphine was made. Um, and the company who make this product um, contracted a, an enzyme research company to specifically look at the last synthesis step, which was to take this one carbonyl that I've got ringed in blue, this oxygen here, got one oxygen, and transaminate that to this nitrogen to give you the finished product. And so it's only one step in the synthesis of this whole molecule that they were looking at to change to a, a biocatalytic step. And I'll just give you a slide on, on how they went about that. So if we look first at the chemocatalytic step, so this is how they were running the final step originally before they contracted the enzyme company. They transaminate with uh, ammonium acetate there. But what I want you to notice is that it's, it's using a metal catalyst, a heavy metal catalyst, and it's under high pressure. So can you imagine doing these things at scale? You need to provide that heavy metal catalyst in a certain amount and maintain that under high pressure. Uh, and then after that, you have to clean it up. You can't give that sort of product to people You're using carbon treatment to remove that. So it's a purification step. And that generates your product. And this is a value of enantiopurity. So you remember I was talking about how it's important to have your product being in anti pure to avoid any side effects, off effects. Sorry, there we go. It's only 97% in anti pure which means 3% of your final product you have to remove and you've lost then some of your profit, your product yield from that. And then a final step is a cleanup here with heptane, an organic solvent, an isopropyl alcohol, and then a, with the phosphate group, okay, to your final product. So you can see here that you need a metal catalyst and rhodium. So you have to mine that out of the ground. That's not very sustainable. It has a huge water usage. It's high pressure. There's an energy cost, an infrastructure cost to maintain that pressure. And there's two steps of purification, okay? With the carbon treatment and then the treatment with the heptane. Now the company 
came in and said, we can do this for you, but we'll do it with one step and one uh, enzyme. Under uh, aqueous conditions, sort of neutral pHs, you don't need the pressure, you don't need the metal catalyst, and you don't need the cleanup step with the heptane. Okay, and not only that, but we'll give it to you at 99.95% EE. So you've, again, your, your loss of product is much smaller. So you can see here that there's a sustainability gain, not only for the company on cost and product yield, but we can see if we reference back those sustainability uh, sort of metrics or overviews, there's the one for good health and well-being. We're producing and maintaining the medicine, so more sustainability. Energy, we've reduced our energy demand because we don't need to maintain the high pressure. That feeds into uh, climate action as well. You reduce your, since most energy is not derived from renewable sources, fossil fuel sources, you reduce your CO2 output. Um, the, rem the removal of the metal catalyst means you don't have to waste water in the mining process. You don't have the off effects of mining, which can also, you know, waste runoff of mines getting into the water supply affecting aquatic life and life on land with open cast mining. You can start to see how this one step switching it out to a biocatalytic step can have these knock-on effects on all of these sustainability metrics. And probably from the company's point of view, which is also very important, important it's an increase in their profit margin because they had to take less step to make the product they have less cost, but also they're generating their compound at a higher yield. So that's one nice use of biocatalysis in an industrial setting, but that's only one step in a larger synthesis. The next um, example I'm gonna to give to you is um, the tr trying to take a pathway for the synthesis of a drug in nature and transporting that wholesale, I was gonna say wholesale, into a different organism. Um, and that, that drug molecule is artemisinin. You may have heard of it. It's an important uh, anti-malarial treatment. And uh, that's still very important because deaths from malaria are still very high, half a million a year more. And over the course of human history, of course, malaria has been one of the biggest killers of, of, of mankind. Um, and artemisinin is produced from the tree, or the sweet wormwood, artemisinin, artemisia annua. So to produce that, you have to grow large crops, water, harvest, devote land usage to those crops as well, uh, to harvest and extract the, the product. So if you could take the pathway that makes artemisinin and transfer that into a single cell organism, like yeast, you could intensify your production, okay, by making large amounts of artemisinin in your yeast on a smaller footprint. You'd remove the need for land usage, for the water usage to water those plants, and you'd intensify the project, put your production of artemisinin on a more sustainable footing. Because, of course, as the effects from climate change progress, uh, that will affect seas, affects growing conditions, uh, weathers in certain areas. And of course, then that will affect your crop yields. Um, whereas if you put it into a, a single celled organism or, or, or a, mi a microbe, you obviously can control the conditions of the growth and they're not so reliant on weather conditions to produce your product. So there's been a lot of work on trying to do that. And I don't get too hung up on the pathway I'm showing here. I'm going to go into a bit more detail. But the idea was to make use of the first part of the pathway that exists both in Artemisia annua and yeast. So taking acetyl-CoA to farnesyl pyrophosphate and then adding a few of the enzymes which only exist in Artemisia annua into yeast to complete that pathway. And I just delve that into that a bit more deeply here because this is a more complex problem than simply using an enzyme that you produce in scale and then applying that to a chemical synthesis in sort of pure semi-pure ways you're dealing with a, an organism here a living system that has its own uh, desires it wants to grow and divide it doesn't necessarily want to produce what you want to produce so it required a lot more engineering of the genome and a lot more uh, thought about which enzymes to include so it was really broken down into three parts. And the first part was the upregulation of this Farnesyl pyro 
pyrophosphate pathway now that exists in yeast and it existed in Artemisia annua as well. And it makes this intermediate here on the left, farnesyl pyrophosphate, which is folded up into one of the uh, precursors of artemisinin. And that existed already in yeast. The challenge was to upregulate that pathway to make as much of farnesyl pyrophosphate as possible. And they did that by uh, adding in more of those genes. So they, here you can see they've doubled the number of the genes in the genome for this enzyme, but also increasing the production, the transcription and translation of the other enzymes in the pathway. And this then led to a larger pool of farnesyl pyrophosphate, which could be taken through to the desired product. The second part of their work was to take the enzymes from artemisinin annua, which were responsible for taking farnesyl pyrophosphate and converting it into artemisinin. OK, so they take in the ADS, that's the morphodiene synthase here, which folds up that long molecule into this ring structure. And then they also included cytochrome P450 and its reductase. Don't get too bogged down in that. They're just type of enzymes which will do the jobs, adds the hydroxyl here, adds another hydroxyl and does the oxidation to artemisinic acid. And then they did an extraction and a semi-synthesis and then a chemical synthesis on the top of that. So that was the second part of it, to add the enzymes from artemisinin annual, which would actually create the precursor, the molecule. And the third part of the pathway, which may not have been obvious, it makes sense to upregulate the pathway which makes your starting material. And it makes sense to take the enzymes from the organism to make the actual molecule. But like I said, these organisms have, don't necessarily want to make what you're making they have their own needs they want to grow and provide the metabolites for their own growth and internal to yeast it uses farnesyl pyrophosphate to make squalene and ergosterol okay and if you make a lot of farnesyl pyrophosphate by increasing the flux through this pathway the yeast will just take that through its natural pathways and make more of an ergosterol so it takes that starting substrate away from what you want to make and makes what's, what it wants to make. So the third section of the work was to the downregulate that squalene pathway. So make the organism make less of those enzymes, which meant less of the farnesyl pyrophosphate would go through to ergosterol, more would be available be, to be turned into artemisinic acid and then into artemisinin. Okay, so you can see there's two different approaches there to production of a fine chemical, a pharmaceutical. One is to do, have a full synthesis, chemical synthesis, and identify individual parts which are amenable to biocatalysis. The other is to try and do a wholesale production in a microorganism. And there are strengths and weaknesses to the approach. The strength of this approach, of course, is that you can feed your yeast on a simple sugar, so from simple starting materials. OK, that you can generate sustainably and it will feed through to your final product with acetagliptin, obviously, with the chemical synthesis that will start probably most likely from fossil fuel feedstocks. OK, and then as you can generate those sustainability uh, sustainably, then obviously there is still a slight unsustainable element to it as well. So how does this rate then? on our sustainability metrics. What could we think about? Well, good health and well-being. obviously, you are stabilizing and, in, and uh, ensuring the production of a very key uh, treatment for malaria, a huge problem uh, across the world. Decent work and economic growth. So the production of this, it creates jobs, it creates industry, it creates infrastructure. You have to create the places to grow, the fermenters, you have to train the people to to run the operation and things like that, or has the ability to do that. The two I put on there, which you might think, oh, that's a bit strange, is life on land and zero hunger. And that could possibly be an outcome of your change in land use. So if you intensify the process of artemisinin production using the microbiological aspect here, as I mentioned before, you reduce the need to grow the plants, which means you reduce the land use and depending on the type of land that the trees need that could then be turned over to farming arable or livestock production okay which allows for food production which addresses 
hunger or the requirement for food for people. OK, but also it may be that the land depends on the tree. If the tree kind of like can deal with tolerate harsh conditions and you're growing the trees somewhere where you wouldn't grow crops or farm animals, then it could just be a rewilding exercise and increasing biodiversity as well. So those are all things to think about. And of course, it's not all positive because the growth and production of artemisium annua, the tree, provides jobs for people as well. And it doesn't require or doesn't necessarily require high educational input. So those jobs may be or lower income sectors. So if you replace those jobs with higher education requiring jobs or this different sector, are you actually going backwards on decent work and economic growth for certain sections of your population and these of course are things that you have to consider as well when talking about sustainability and putting these things in place okay i'm just checking the time so those are two sort of different applications of biocatalysis one is very focused industry production the other one is a more wide scale uh, genome engineering and wholesale production of a final product okay uh, but those are both concerned with making things like making things that we want to use. What about degrading things? What about getting rid of the waste that we put out there? OK, and um, that's been sort of a new area of growth in the past five or 10 years. I'm just looking at the data on this publication here. So a lot of these work I've referenced, if you're interested in looking at the papers. 2016, OK, um, obviously we produce a huge amount of plastic waste. PET in particular is a, is a, is a big uh, component of plastic waste, 82 million metric tonnes of PET produced a year and that doesn't go anywhere it just gets degraded broken down to smaller bits washed out into the ocean into the soils into our bodies yeah how do we deal with that how do we degrade that and people because it's a new new molecule to the biosphere you know past 100 years with the development of fossil fuel industries have organisms had time to respond to that new material and create or not create but evolve degradative enzymes so in 2016 a group of scientists went out look in areas of particularly plastic heavily contaminated plastic waste and they found an organism that would grow on pet and it would make biofilms sit on the surface and it would hit the surface of the pet yeah so that's that's un uh, grown on pet and this is grown on pet because it pits the surface and they did a bit more investigation and what they found was that it produced two enzymes a petase and a metase the petase would break the long uh, polymers into individual units which is met and the metase would further break that down and then it would be assimilated through its pathway and used as a carbon source so there's a possibility here, and it's the thing about petases and metases, so it's fairly new. It was an old, it was an enzyme that already existed, a lipase that they used for breaking ester bonds, which already existed, but it's evolved to be able to act on PET. Okay. It's not great. It needs to find new examples of petases, but it's a beginning of a way to think about how we might use biocatalysis to start to remediate some of the plastic wastes that we've put out into the environment. Okay. And how does that work on our on our, our sustainability metrics? Well, the petase is not at the stage of the cytogliptin example, not even at the stage of the um, Artemisinin example, it's still very early stages, is discovered in 2016. Work is ongoing to identify new and no, uh, different petases and metases, but also work is ongoing to engineer them through a process of mutation, to make them work better, to make them work under different conditions, to speed up the degradation of, of, of PET. Okay. Um, and what about our sustainability metrics? Well, that feeds very nicely to 12 responsible consumption production if it's possible for us to produce plastic degrade it reclaim those inputs and remake we can close the circle there and the thing with plastics is that obviously we use too much really single use but there will always probably be a use for some plastics in sterile production of medications or the delivery of medicines as well probably always will be 
the place for them and how do we maintain that sustainably? Um, innovation, industry and infrastructure, of course, there's still lots of work to be done to find more examples of these enzymes, engineer them, make them better and then scale them up and use them. How would we use them in an industrial setting to bulk degrade PET if it ever got to that stage? And of course, then that has a knock on effect on climate action because then if we can reuse and recycle plastics, we probably won't need to generate as many from fossil fuel feedstocks, which plays into CO2 release, okay? But also it makes things better for life in aquatic and on land because we won't have the contamination in our seas and our oceans of this microplastics, this plastic waste, or these sites of huge landfills full of plastic as well, yeah? Okay. Well, that's great. I mean, I've given you three examples there. Uh, one of them is already in place in industry. The other one is coming through and Petes is, has more work to go. And I painted a very rosy picture of biocatalysis there. Of, you say, great, that's great, Jack. How, when are we going to roll it out to everything that we do in industry and in all drug production and things like that? And um, the reason or some of the stumbling blocks uh, for why it hasn't potentially made such an impact or hasn't yet broken through in all our production, productive capacities, especially from pharmaceuticals or in other materials, is an outcome of some of their strengths. Now on the screen, I've got images of two molecules I've already talked about, talked about morphine on the top right and artemisinin on the top left. The bottom left is a precursor to uh, paracetamol or aspirin. It's salicylic acid which becomes acetyl salicylic acid. It's a common analgesic. And bottom right, the complicated structure bottom right, is taxol, uh, an anti-cancer. All three very important pain relief, either pain relief, paracetamol and morphine, or treatments of very serious uh, diseases that claim hundreds of thousands of lives each year. They're all complicated 3D structures with the decorations, the chirality. And the enzymes that have evolved to make these things are very specific or can be very specific for the particular region or the addition. And that's great when you're trying to make that example of that chemical, but in the case of citagliptin or other pharmaceuticals, there may be non-natural products or they may not look like the molecules the enzymes usually work on. And that means that the enzymes may not work as well on this new substrate or not at all. It also, if you're fitting into uh, uh, long-standing industrial processes, you may have to fit into reaction conditions which are uh, facilitate better organic chemistry for the upstream, but aren't particularly suited for the enzyme you're using. And different enzymes will have different tolerances to all of those conditions. So different enzymes will be able to tolerate higher or lower pHs and work better at those pHs. They'll tolerate temperatures better or different solvent conditions, organic or aqueous. They'll accept different substrates, different sizes, different shapes, different uh, regions and additions, which is covered by region stereo selectivity here. And different enzymes will still have different patterns, different uh, abilities to handle those conditions. So one of the things that you can do to address that is by trying to expand the number of enzyme sequences that you have available to do the job. So you can either look for examples of the same type of enzyme, so transaminase or a lipase, which has a different sequence, has then a different potential, slightly different structure or shape, active site, which will give you a different uh, profile. Or you can take existing ones, existing enzymes, and do en and engineer them. Go through rounds of mutation, mutate the amino acids, try and change the function that way. And in fact, in citagliptin, that's what they did. The uh, citagliptin is quite an extended molecule, quite charged at some parts. Um, the enzyme that they started with went through 20 rounds of mutation before it finally accepted that final product or the starting substrate in good yields with good turnover, okay? So those are two approaches that you can take. And I wanna talk about the first one, which is discovering new enzymes, because that's the approach that we take here. That's my work and the work we've been doing here. And we use a technique or a process uh, of metagenomics. 
for biocatalysis discovery. Now, metagenomics is a somewhat new technique. This was coined in 98, so it's not super new, but it's new in terms of, of some parts of science. And it's the analysis of organisms by their DNA, and it avoids having to grow them in the lab. And traditionally, if you wanted to study an organism, and kind of like they did with the petes, they went out, they took samples, they grow, they see what, what grew and it grew on the plastic. They said, okay, this must be able to degrade the plastic. But there'd been lots of organisms in that sample, which for whatever reason, they just couldn't get to grow in the lab, okay? And how much of the diversity are you missing by trying to approach things that way? Well, it turns out only about one to 5% of organisms in any given environment can be cultured in the lab. So 95% of the diversity, and that's the life, but also then the enzymes that those bacteria use, are not accessible in that way. And with the advent of next generation sequencing technology, and that's technology which allows you to sequence large amounts of DNA very quickly, and also then uh, align those sequences and build back into bigger stretches of DNA, what you can do is instead of trying to culture um, organisms on a plate, you can take a sample, extract the DNA from that sample, Okay, and sequence it completely, and then have a look at it in silico and pull out enzyme sequences from that data uh, and make those enzymes and then test them, gaining access to that 95% of microbial dark matter, they, they call it. Okay, and that's the process that we've been using here at UCL, and my work has been on that. We've used it to find transaminases, the type of enzymes that we used in citagliptin production, but also other classes of enzymes which are really important for generating pharmaceuticals, carbonyloreductases, important for making chiral alcohols in a lot of pharmaceutical relevant uh, chemicals as well. And that's the work that we're going to continue. And so far, we've that's been very effective for us. We've generated tens to hundreds of enzymes, but as the next generation sequencing technology gets more powerful, the number of enzymes for retrieval becomes larger, okay? So what we wanna to do to take it to the next level is to make it more high throughput, introduce automation, introduce robotics, liquid handling, put that all on an automated footing and make the retrieval of hundreds to thousands of enzyme types, sequences possible. And we're doing that here at Biochemical Engineering, but also I'll be moving across to UCL East, which is the new building for UCL, at Manufacturing the Futures Laboratory when that gets opened in 2023. Um, so we're looking to pursue that research there as well. So I know I've got just a minute left, so I'm just gonna go over some takeaways and then we'll, we'll open it up to questions, okay? So coming back to the sustainable goals, how can, and I hope that I've shown that biocatalysis can address some of these sustainable goals, okay, or, or go some way to making our processes more sustainable. And I think that in the future, we will definitely see that biocatalysis will reduce the need for petrochemical feedstocks, important in CO2 production and addressing climate change. That's also true for energy demands. We won't need the high temperatures and pressures of reaction conditions of organic chemistry. Again, that plays into CO2 emissions. Okay, reduce the need for metal catalysis. So there's a water sustainability issue there, an environmental issue there. Sustainably sourced pharmaceuticals. So we'll be able to produce pharmacal, pharmaceuticals, hit those medicinal and life sustainabilities, but do it in a sustainable way. Hopefully it will play a huge role in recycling and remediation of the waste that we've already put out into the environment. And Doing all those things, making those things happen, we'll have to develop the technologies to make those happen, which creates the new jobs, the new growth, but also requires the quality education, okay? But also then when we deliver that quality education, we can address some of these things which we haven't talked about perhaps here, gender equality, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, and partnerships across institutions, okay? And that's where those bits come into it as well. Okay, and I think that's it. I'm going to stop there pretty much just a minute over. I apology, apologize. But I hope, I hope that's given you a good overview of the topic, the subject, and, 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 and you know, excited you about it. Um, it's a very exciting field to work in. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I 
forgot to say at the start of the session that um, sometimes people are asked uh, when they're uh, attending the taster lectures, um, am I expected to know this before doing a degree? That's not the case at all. Um, our modules are structured in such a way that when you're introduced to a subject, you will have done the necessary groundwork. So you'll see that the modules for every program, whether it's um, you know, the BSc or the BN Dremenge, it's structures that'll take you from what you've learnt at A level or IBAC or equivalent, and then you will be able to build on that. So this is exactly something that you will have been prepared for when you come to that point. So um, I hope that's reassuring if uh, some, some of the aspects will have felt uh, quite advanced. Um, please, can you put your questions in the Q&A box if you have any? We're really looking forward to receiving them. We've got a few that have come through already, so that's, um, that's great to see. Um, whilst we're just waiting for anybody to add more that you want to, I would like to mention that this is one of a series of lectures that we have. I'm sure you will have seen the others, but if you haven't, we've also got some really uh, exciting ones coming up on um, synthetic biology and vaccine manufacture, which I, if you've attended this, I'm sure you'll find very interesting. That's being presented by Dr. Steffi Frank. We've got the part two of the um, lab-grown food uh, lecture, which is actually going to be presented by one of our alumni who works in Hoxton Farms. So that's someone who's gone on to um, to actually do the, do this in the real world. So it's not just us talking as academics and researchers. This is from someone who is actually growing food in the in the lab in the real world. Uh, we've also got a session on a um, on regenerative medicine and another one on um, w which is going to be on biosensing. And th this is um, from from Dr. Mike Thomas. So, uh, and I see that someone's put a question in the, in the chat box. Could you please put them in the Q&A box? It's just way easier for us to answer them. We can't sort of keep track of them if you put them in the chat box. So if you could just put that in the Q&A box, box that would be great. Um, Jack, if you've had a chance to look through the questions, uh, perhaps you'd like to choose which of the many that have come through you think we can answer in the given time. Yeah, let's have a look. Um... Yeah, the question about uh, bacteria that can degrade plastics. So and like releasing them in the environment. Well, they've, they, the, in this particular study, they found them already in the, in the environment. Um, so they're already out there degrading plastic. Um, so it's not a question of releasing them. I think what that question comes from would be the idea of designing or creating a synthetic or genetically modified organism, which could degrade plastic and then releasing that into the environment. And in that way, that under current regulations, certainly for ethical reasons, isn't allowed, right? Because you don't know about knock-on effects, escape, and how that would happen. But these nature will develop and has developed enzymes which degrade, degrade plastic. It's a resource to be utilized by bacteria, by microorganisms, um, and nature will find a way, or evolution will drive a way to utilize that resource so they already exist and, and they're out there but i think what that question kind of was getting at was the idea of us creating something and releasing it and certainly you couldn't do that uh under current guidelines and there are definitely big questions around the ethics of genetically modified organisms being released into the environment yeah i hope that answers the question Thank you. And if, if we don't answer your question, please do feel free to come back and um, expand on it. Um, somebody's actually just said here, uh, in terms of sustainability, um, adding world population. That I mean, the whole point of, as Jack said, the point about sustainability, green. You know, these, these are term. This is terminology that hasn't. You know, it gets used in different situations. So, absolutely. You know, it, it'd make a lot of sense to think about how we, how we phrase that. Yeah, the thing with world population is if you look at. And especially in terms of CO2 release, okay, the world populations responsible for the majority of CO2 release are in the Western developed nations, and as a proportion of world population, they're actually quite small. So when we talk about population in that way, I think what we have to do is think, which are the populations which are emitting the most CO2? How do we ameliorate or moderate their behaviour to reduce the CO2 emissions they produce. And I always say to people who raise this, that you could, if you could, remove completely the CO2 emissions of the continent of Africa, and it wouldn't make a drop of, in the ocean of difference to climate change, because their output to CO2 emissions is negligible compared to industrialised developed nations. Okay, I know it's a continent and we're comparing nation states, but if we take North America, Europe, okay, 
So that's when we're talking about population, I think it's very important to understand which populations are responsible for the bulk of CO2 emissions and address our ways of making it sustainable by focusing on those first. Okay. That's more of a political and economic question, I think, than a scientific question. <laughs> but since it was raised and we talked about it, I thought it's very good to discuss it in that respect. I mean, actually, just just something um, I'm, I'm going to ask. I'm going to jump in and ask Jack about this. Is mm. that um, UCL is not me, not just a technical scientific um, uh, university. We are a multidisciplinary university. Yeah. We have the Slade, Slade School of Art, the Bartlett School of Architecture. So I think it's it's worth just mentioning because somebody's touched on it. The context that we also have philosophy, ethics, and yeah. and it's it, you know perhaps Jack, you'd like to talk about what it means researching in a context of a multidisciplinary university where all these things come up yeah i think when you work in a lab and you work within the confines of your discipline it's very easy to lose sight of the wider ethical political and economic impacts of your work now the <clears throat> ucl and the bodies we work with the research bodies the funding bodies are putting in place things to make you think more about how your work impacts, and that's a big word that they use, society and stakeholders, which is society, community groups, the wider environment. So that's inbuilt. But of course, when you're doing your work at your lab bench, it's easy to lose sight of that. UCL's good at when taking it to scale or taking it to collaborate. And I, I collaborated with industry on my PhD and with my postdoc. Then it really comes to the fore that you have to discuss the political perhaps less so, but definitely the economic outputs of those with companies, but also, you know, moral and ethical outreach and considerations as well. And having those departments at UCL, and having the infrastructure in place definitely plays a huge role in the research that we do here. Um, and just to, to say as well, that in terms of um, sustainability, one of the projects that we have is part of the plastics hub. Mm. Um, so we, we, we've got a Professor John Ward who's actually looking at, at how you develop enzymes that can break down plastics, but that doesn't happen in isolation. There's also behavioural change. So we work with the Centre of Behavioural Change at UCL um, with uh, Susan Mickey. So you may have heard people on radio or TV talking about how people uh, respond in the pandemic. We're also looking at how people change their behaviour, how you design packaging, different materials. So it's... I just wanted just wanted to bring 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 that into play as well and mention that you know it's 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 a holistic response to to the global problems but you but biochemical engineering plays that role within 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 the overall solution absolutely and ucl manufacturing the futures laboratory at ucl east is meant to be interdisciplinary so that's a collaboration between biochemical engineering chemical engineering chemistry i think i've got all three there um and will be the academics going in so it's meant to be cross and interdisciplinary from the outset um so that's that's something we're really looking forward to should we look for a different another question okay yeah in meta how do you digitize the sequence from a dna extract so you have the extract the dna and um Usually a company now, because it's so advanced, will provide the service, you send your DNA away, and they use a certain technologies. Illumina technology is a very common one. It uses uh, hmm, polymerase chain reaction. You guys might have come uh, done that in your studies to amplify the DNA lots of times. And as it puts the base pairs in, so as it puts the A or the T or the C or the G in, uh, they have colored dyes on or fluorophores. And every time they add one, they take a picture and then they wash that one off, put the next one on, take a picture. And so they have these iterative steps of washing on and off. They capture all of the signals and then that's put through their software bioinformatically, gives you the readout A, T, C, G, T, C, G. But usually they're very short reads, about 250 base pairs for Illumina. And then you have software on computers which will take those short reads, look for areas of homology, matching them up between them, and then try and scaffold those back up into longer reads and then depending on how much dna you've given how complicated how complicated it is how how many different organisms it's come from you get different lengths of uh scaffold that's it's the technology they use to sequence the human genome okay so when i was younger the human genome project was still going on 
and it took 10 to 13 years, costs billions of dollars, and it got a single human genome out at the end. You can sequence a human genome in a week now for about 5,000 pounds. Okay, to give you a, the scale of that change over that, then that's my lifetime, you know, and that's a, it's like a portion of my life, it's not even my whole lifetime. So they're very powerful, that, that technology, and getting more powerful every year. Uh, uh, enzymes for inorganic reaction synthesis. There, yeah, I mean, so I touched, I mean, I think about biocatas, it's such a big and broad area, but there are definitely people who will use protein as a scaffold to which to attach um, metals or different parts in, in an engineering way to carry out what might be considered more classical inorganic or organic synthesis chemistry using sort of a, a protein scaffold that they've defined or maybe using one from nature that they've just made some adjustments to. Um, yeah, definitely. And that's a very exciting uh, area of research. And that can means that you can do some sort of non, not non-natural, but reaction chemistries which aren't, don't exist in uh, nature catalysis, uh, biocatalysis. So it's like a fusion of the two almost. Yeah. So I can just see that we're down to the last question. So just before just before Jack answers that one. Um, I just want to say that if you're interested in any of the programs that we do, any of the BNG, MNG programs, we've got a virtual open day, which will be happening towards the end of this month. Jack and myself will be available. We'll be, able, we'll be talking in detail about the programs, composition, uh, careers, pathways, so anything else. So if you'd like to know more about studying a degree with us, please join us then. If you want to join us in person and actually meet us in real life, that would be great. We can show you around the laboratories and you can meet the team. Um, and that's happening in, in uh, July. So I'm gonna put a link in the chat. Please sign up to that if you're interested in coming along. It'd be great to see you. If you're interested in any of the MSc programs, please just, you, you already signed up through UCL uh, Radius. So um, you left your details with us and we'll let you know about any events we've got coming up with the team then. Um, so I'm just gonna hand over to Jack for the last question. Yeah, great. Okay, well, this last one. Yeah, well, it's good to hear that you're a prospective candidate. Um, and uh, I, as Kim says, I'll be at the open days. But just to let you guys know, I also teach. Okay, so I teach if you come to us, I will teach your uh, one of your modules. And that's a core module molecular biology. Okay, and some parts of that will be catalysis. So um, it'd be great to see you there. Um, I have an idea to select design the enzymes for catalysis pathways. I think if it, when you're an undergraduate student, your first two years were sort of taught courses, your third year, you'll have a research project and in that space, we can start getting into the labs and designing projects. And uh, yeah, we'll discuss when you're thinking about what enzymes you want to use and what pathways you want to use, it's good to identify what your target will be. That will then imply what your starting materials will be and what enzymes you might use to get to it. And actually it's not usually, it's not always, oh, it's this one, this one, and this one. There might be multiple routes that you have to sketch out and say, okay, which one's more feasible? Which one is more, is cheaper often a lot of times, you know, things like that, which one's more available. Um, so yeah, but that's, uh, that's something that we will go through as we go through the course, I think, definitely. Great. Thank you very much. And that actually brings us perfectly to the end of our questions. And the end Excellent of timing. Um, so yeah, that, that, it's almost as if you organise that. That's uh, we, we're normally rushing the questions. At the Professional, end. Kim. Or, or <laughs> that's our watchword. <laughs> but I, I mean, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and for those questions. Yeah, really they're, appreciate they're it. Really, really interesting to get through them. Um, so there will be a follow up email to this to do the recording once you've had a chance to uh, check the transcription and upload it. You do have my email address. This will be sent to you. If you have anything that you that you'd like to get in touch with us about, please do get in touch. We're we're always um, happy to help out if we can. Um, in the meantime, have a great day and. Uh, Thanks again for joining us and thank you for your kind words. We really appreciate uh, you joining us. Bye, thank bye. You everybody. Bye bye.